for taking the time. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now and just put a few thoughts up on the board. Um, I'm very excited to speak with you about the Commonwealth FinTech Toolkit. Uh, this was a project that uh, Mr. Mitchell initiated uh, out of the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, and asked me and a team of other experts to get involved with um, to help provide some guidance and frameworks for Commonwealth member countries as they think through the impact of technological innovation on both their financial systems and on solving critical problems uh, that they are experiencing in their societies. And, and that's really an important point to think about as we begin our discussion, which is that people don't buy technology. Okay? They buy solutions to problems. People don't adopt technology. They adopt solutions to problems. And so as we think about how financial technology and Web3, blockchain, other artificial intelligence, all of these different technologies, if we think about how they impact uh, business, commerce, and society, um, we want to look at ways in which they can solve significant problems. So just briefly on who we are, uh, a Visionary Future uh, is, is a, a venture studio and think tank that I started about 20 years ago. Uh, we've helped facilitate creating new businesses uh, in over 150 countries, um, working with major academic institutions. Um, we've worked with a number of governmental and non-governmental non bodies, um, particularly at the axis of uh, techn technology policy and technological innovation. Um, and we put together quite a body of thought leadership. So uh, Global FinTech is the latest book. Uh, this just came out uh, a couple of months ago this year. Um, and in particular, uh, Global FinTech from MIT Press, I'll, I'll point it out to you because about a third of the book discusses policy approaches to fintech um, that we authored together with uh, regulators and policymakers. Um, so a good resource to take a look at if you're looking for sort of deeper reading beyond the Commonwealth Fintech Toolkit. Okay, so let's just talk through a little bit of context, right? And, and I think context is important, as, as was mentioned in my introduction. You know, I am what they call a pracademic so I span between the academic world, where I get to currently at Imperial College, uh, London, look across many, many different countries and many, many different companies and understand how they work and how they function and where they're going, um, and the practical world, where I advise and sit on the boards of various private companies frequently involved in building this new future of a new financial system. But if we go back in time about four years ago, um, uh, the, the Commonwealth Central Bank governors said they really wanted to uh, have improved technical guidance regarding the implementation of FinTech activities. And, and the timing is important to remember, right? So this was 2018. Um, this was very foresighted because as you may be aware, under COVID, there was rapid and widespread adoption of fintech, even in communities who had previously kind of backed off from or refused to adopt financial technology. So digital finance grew about 50% from 2020 to 2021 because people were forced to. And once people were forced to try out these new technologies, a lot of people saw that, well, maybe they're not so bad. Maybe it's okay to use my mobile phone to handle my bills or or, or maybe it's okay to, to try and, and uh, um, use this neobank or this new form of bank rather than the traditional bank, or, or maybe it's okay uh, to send a payment directly to a peer rather than going through a traditional payment system. Um, and so ahead of all of that sort of pandemic-driven adoption, um, the central bank governors were saying, you know, we really want to get some strength and, and uh, um, assembly of best practices around what to do with fintech and particularly with fintech policy and, and the timing of this was you know really a time of change so first of all um there was and there continues to be a significant problem around identity right identity is a keystone issue about nearly half the world's population are underbanked or unbanked because of identity 
either they don't have a legal identity, in the case of about a billion people, or the identity they have is very thin, and it doesn't include things like a rich credit file, which might allow them to get loans. And women and children disproportionately are sort of suffering from the, the lack of legal identity. Um, and so this has been identified as a, a UN Sustainable Development Goal or a Global Goal, Target 16.9, which is to provide a universal legal identity. Um, on the side of small businesses, 95% of the world's small businesses are underbanked. And, and this is incredibly important because pretty much all new jobs that generate you know, income for families so they can buy foods and buy goods and services, pretty much all new jobs on a net basis are created by small businesses and fast growth businesses. Really, really big companies you might hear of like Coca-Cola or Nike, big companies tend to cut jobs. They're trying to get more efficient. They're trying to improve their shareholder return. So they're constantly trying to cost cut and eliminate jobs. And when they acquire a business, frequently part of how they pay for acquiring the business is by firing a bunch of people, eliminating jobs. Small companies are constantly creating new jobs. So, so we sort of heard me at the, at the top of the call in, in the introduction, you know, I run a, a digital learning company that focuses a lot on digital finance called Esme Learning. We created 100 new jobs in one year because we're a fast growth private company. And, and other companies are, are you know, likewise creating a lot of those new jobs. So if we don't provide financing to these small businesses, um, we really create challenges for being able to uh, um, uh, accelerate economic growth. And, and so, so the underbanked nature of the small business world is also a significant problem. But there are new ways of establishing credit for people, both for consumers and for businesses, based on big data analytics, based on AI, uh, that promote access, that can help more people get access to the financial system. Um, Data portability, things like open banking and GDPR, um, help with uh, fostering competition, which can help lower prices and improve quality of service for consumers and businesses. But with these new technologies, we've also got new cyber risks. And so that's also a problem that needs to be addressed when you're thinking about regulating and managing a financial system. Uh, you want to look not only at, at kind of how you can create opportunity, but how in the process you don't inadvertently create a big problem in the form of cyber vulnerability. And a lot of platform companies are trying to get into this world of digital financial services. So um, WeChat, for example, uh, has over a billion active users. More than 20% of WeChat users are using the platform for payments. And, and frequently, you know, banking regulators central and central bankers and supervisors are not thinking about telecoms when they think about managing the financial system or managing banking. They're thinking about banks and non-bank finance companies and maybe fintechs. But the platform companies are also really important to consider. Now, this is a generalization. It is starting to change. So. You may recall that, that Facebook tried to launch a digital currency, um, and there were a lot of concerns around it. In fact, so many concerns that eventually they shut down the project because people just didn't feel that there would be sufficient consumer protection uh, uh, and that it was too anti-competitive to allow the world's largest social network to also overnight become the world's largest financial services company. There's a lot of regulatory confusion, right? So, so a few years ago now, but still relatively recently, um, OECD looked at cryptocurrency regulation. And, and at the time, out of the G20, let's say, um, four countries completely banned crypto. Seven regulated it under existing rules. Um, two just mandated uh, a suspicious activities reports. And, and 11 passed new crypto-specific regulation. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of policy all over the place. I mean, you can see it if you look at even just the difference between the U.S., Bermuda, the U.K., 
and Singapore. Very, very different approaches to thinking about cryptocurrency and blockchain and things. Even the difference between the US and Canada. Very, very different approaches to thinking about crypto and crypto re regulation. Um, the, the, the countries in, in the, the Caribbean have been more forward leaning, more progressive in thinking about crypto. Um, and uh, I don't want to just single out Bermuda. There were several countries ranging from the Bahamas to, we, we had a number of participants in uh, uh, the consultations around the FinTech Policy Toolkit. Um, but you know, as soon as you start moving money across borders, you start running into this problem of the fact that you don't have harmonized uh, approaches, right? Um, and, and so even from when the OECD did that, that policy survey, you know, South Korea went from banning crypto to, to reversing the ban, and now with the collapse of Luna and the TerraCoin, uh, which was a, a stable coin, a kind of cryptocurrency, now there's talk of new regulation. So people are still, and when I say people, I mean governments, are still taking a fairly discoordinated approach to thinking about these things and, and would benefit from a little more consistency. And, th and that's part of what the Commonwealth FinTech Toolkit is trying to provide. So, so let's let's talk about sort of the process we went through to make it. Um, so, so Comsec engaged Visionary Future uh, in the spring of 2019. Um, we did a, a, a workshop where we brought in cent central bankers, non-governmentals, major banks um, to refine the scope to make sure that we were pointed at the right problem. That was in July of 2019 at at Comsec uh, headquarters. Um, we then conducted uh, an extensive series of interviews with about a third of the Commonwealth countries um, in, in the July to October time frame, trying to get an understanding of both what people were working on and also where they had questions or, or issues. Um, after we created a draft of the toolkit, we solicited feedback from about a dozen countries um, to further refine what we were talking about and how we were presenting the information. Um, we delivered a draft of the toolkit in early November of 2019. Um, and then uh, in January 2020, um, we began sort of extending things a little further around best practices uh, for packages of interrelated interventions. So policy actions, rules, government outreach, and how that can support FinTech. Uh, and those workshops were conducted both in, at Davos at the World Economic Forum annual meeting uh, and also in, in Bermuda. Uh, um, uh, where, where uh, the uh, uh, premier very kindly uh, um, hosted our uh, uh, our activities, um, and so this is all uh, documented on the Commonwealth FinTech Toolkit website, um, where there are resources and videos that further amplify what we were talking about in the toolkit. So, what's the design of the toolkit? By the way, before I go any further uh, into, into talking about the design, are, are there any questions from the audience? So I have a question. Um, yes. Now we notice that the crypto market is crashing currently. It's under 30,000 today. So with our uh, initiative of moving to digital economy, digital finance, how can we revitalize you know, the, th the trust in the crypto market currently, because it's, it's just crazy. It's Luna, it's Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah a absolutely. So, so it, it's helpful to um, not have, uh, uh, it's helpful to have a, a, a full perspective of this and, and to not panic. Um, so first of all, I will note that I just checked the prices right now. Bitcoin is back above 30,000. So, uh, you know, it, Cryptocurrency is not the same thing as fintech. These are two important concepts to separate. Cryptocurrency is a subset of fintech. There is, you know, you, you can argue very successfully to me that, that crypto is a kind of fintech, but fintech encompasses many other things as well. So for example, and we talk about this in, in the toolkit, um, M-Pesa. M-Pesa was a financial innovation, a fintech, that was overlaid on top of telecommunications. And in the process, uh, the government of Kenya in working with M-Pesa was able to help support going from about 26% financial inclusion 
to 83% financial inclusion in 15 years. No Bitcoin involved, no blockchain involved, but it was FinTech. And in fact, it was so successful now that they have pretty much nine out of 10, almost nine out of 10 Kenyans using M-Pesa, they're saying, what else can we put onto this platform now that everyone has it? And are there other things we can offer besides payment services, like, for example, insurance, um, so that we can help enrich the financial lives of our citizens? Um, so, so that's sort of, uh, oh, and while we were talking, Bitcoin went under $30,000. So the, the other thing is, and, and I will disagree respectfully with the government of El Salvador, I would not put my country on Bitcoin. It is too volatile. The price changes too much. You cannot pay people salaries in Bitcoin and hope to feed them week to week consistently because the, the price moves around a lot. It's speculative. It's important to remember that a year and a half ago, Bitcoin was at about $10,000. So if you invested back then, you're doing very well. It is a speculative commodity. It is not something to build a financial system on. But the technology behind Bitcoin, which is called blockchain, is something that can take a lot of cost out of the financial system. You just might use a different kind of blockchain. You might use a central bank digital currency, for example. So I work very closely with uh, Simon Chantry, who is the chief information officer of BIT. BIT was the company that helped uh, Barbados launch the sand dollar. So, um, you know, there, there are um, many different flavors to this technology, to fintech in general, and there are many different flavors to blockchain, which is a kind of fintech. And so while I would not put your entire economy on Bitcoin, um, it's worth exploring different ways in which a variety of technologies, including blockchain, can help reduce costs for consumers and businesses, improve liquidity, provide greater transparency, and uh, help with auditability, help with tax collectability, uh, and help with stability, right? Bringing more tools to the government to help manage the financial system and, and better costs and better competition to the uh, uh, to the consumers and businesses in your economy, uh, so that they can they can enjoy a higher standard of living. So, um, so just very important to separate out cryptocurrency is very exciting, uh, but not all cryptocurrency is the same. And a central bank digital currency, for example, that might be pegged to your uh, um, uh, what we call fiat currency, is something that that um, is worth looking at and is different than Bitcoin. Was there another question? I think I saw someone at the microphone. Good morning. Yes. Let's take you back a little earlier to your, something you said in the early part of the presentation. In 95% of S SMEs that are globally underbanked, could you give a spectrum to their specific issue of being underbanked? Because you only highlighted credit being essentially the main issue, but are there other things? Um, I think credit is the number one issue because it's how they can expand their business, expand payroll, purchase inventory, um, you know, credit writ large, right? Credit broadly speaking, trade credit for uh, uh, buying goods and services for inventory, working capital credit for managing payroll, uh, uh, trade um, uh, supply chain credit, right? To be able to move goods uh, across distances from remote points where they might be uh, acquiring raw materials. Um, but kind of on all dimensions, even current accounts can be difficult for small businesses to open up. Um, and, and so, uh, um, you know, it, it actually ties in as well with the identity function. Because if the owner of the small business doesn't have a good, robust identity, then they're gonna have trouble opening the account as well. Um, the other thing that spans both small business and uh, individual consumer as a problem is, even if you have a legal identity, um, the cost for a financial institution to perform a background check on you might be so great that they can't make money off of that consumer. So the cost of what's known as customer due diligence, whether it's for a small business or for a consumer, is between um, $10 US and $130 US to open up a new account. 
So if you're looking at someone who might have an average balance of $50 US, they're never going to be profitable for that bank. And so a lot of banks have started engaging in what's known as de-risking, where they're actually exiting markets because they can no longer make money off of enough accounts in those markets. Or when they're in a market, they, they are basically not providing banking services to the poorest people in that market because it's too expensive to engage in compliance around identity. Um, so there are ways that governments can help with this, including using our old friend blockchain to help manage identity data. Even though it has nothing to do with cryptocurrency, blockchain itself as a database system can help with this identity problem. Um, so hopefully that, that's a fulsome answer to, to your question. Um, I'm going to move on and, and just talk about the principal elements of the toolkit, but please do continue to think of questions and we'll, we'll pause again for more questions in just a little bit. So in putting together the, the FinTech toolkit, what we're trying to do is combine technical material and also how you can apply it, right? So we have little explainers in the toolkit about different tech topics, like what is blockchain and Bitcoin and, and what is artificial intelligence, and, you know, particularly in the context of, of finance and the financial system. We did uh, kind of a... Um, an explanation of potential policy outcomes that can be achieved by shaping fintech policy and amplified those with case studies of people different countries around the world that had implemented different fintech policies and what those policies looked like and what the outcomes of those policies were and we also discussed some you know sort of notable considerations of the differences faced by large nations versus small nations in shaping fintech policy and, and some of the regional considerations that come into play in different regions of the world. So in talking about the tech topics, for example, we wanted to make it really easy to understand these technical topics for people who are not technical. So this is, this is intended to be an easy to understand explanation for the non-technical professional Little explainers about artificial intelligence, blockchain, digital identity, big data analytics, digital financial services, and cybersecurity. Um, there were a lot of different topics that we could have chosen, but, but these were the ones that we felt were, were the closest to commercial applicability, the closest to real world applicability. So for example, you may have heard of quantum computing and I can tell you two things. One, when it becomes practical, it will change everything about how the financial system works. Because overnight, all of the security that we use will become obsolete. But I will also tell you that we are at least five years away from commercial quantum computing, and maybe 10 years away, possibly even 15 years away. So it's not something that you need to worry about within a near-term policy horizon. But it is something you want to sort of have on the radar down the road. But these topics that I have listed on the screen here, these six topics, are those that really need to be addressed in the immediate term because they are impacting what's happening right now uh, in financial systems all over the world. Um, and then we looked at, at different potential policy outcomes and how the tech topics would influence things like financial inclusion or improving cross-border transactions and trade, or improving economic growth. And so under financial inclusion, you might look for better protections on consumers, lowering costs of AML KYC compliance, encouraging greater financial and data literacy, um, and allowing for greater identity inclusion while helping prevent identity theft. Improving cross-border transactions in trade might look at lower remittance costs, lower AMLC KYC compliance costs, better cybersecurity, um, and in the case of improved economic growth, um, you know you might be looking at things like better transaction speeds or better access to credit for businesses and consumers. These were just three guideline examples of potential policy outcomes. You, of course, have many, many other possible policy outcomes that you could be pursuing. And FinTech has different ways it could help with them, whether that's with things like um, improving collection and disbursement of taxes or 
uh, welfare benefits, social benefits, or managing the costs in the healthcare system and health payments. There are all sorts of applications of fintech in many, many different areas, but we just illustrated three to give you an idea of how these tech topics play out. The case studies ranged from uh, looking at um, using blockchain in Papua New Guinea for a national digital identity, including for people who were uh, not literate. How do you create um, inclusion for people who may not be able to read the, the verification of their, of their system? Um, pioneering mobile money in Kenya, uh, and again, particularly with a focus on M-Pesa. Um, the digital assets business legislation that Bermuda put together to encourage more uh, cryptocurrency companies to, to set up shop there. Um, likewise, in Malta, their support around virtual financial assets. And, and, you know, in general, we're kind of looking at this question of regulating emerging technologies. And so with a focus on financial inclusion, you know, how do you implement digital financial services? Um, we did look at questions of, of small nations and large nations, right? So for our purposes, we defined small nations as less than 1.5 million, and large nations we defined as, as these listed here, UK, Canada, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India. Again, our remit was to look across the Commonwealth countries, the 53 Commonwealth countries. Um, the small nations were, you know, almost everybody else. Um, but then we, we kind of identified a category of what we call frontier nations with larger populations. So they were sort of serving a large number of people, but economically they didn't have the same sort of depth of GDP as places like Canada or Singapore or Australia. Uh, and then, you know, we kind of had a, a mention of Hong Kong as a, a former territory that still has close ties to the Commonwealth. Um, on a regional basis, we did a little bit of comparison of sort of looking at the Americas, in, in, including uh, uh, the Caribbean, uh, North and South America, uh, versus Africa, versus Europe, uh, versus Asia, and some of the differences across these different nations. So we, we then sort of said, you know, basically, how do we do what we're doing today, which is getting the toolkit into the hands of regulators and policymakers. Um, and, and so this is an important and exciting next step of how we move forward with the Commonwealth FinTech Toolkit. Um, so I, I'm Dave Schreier, and uh, th these are my contact details. If you have questions we don't answer today, I'm happy to answer them and follow up. Um, but uh, I, I'd be happy to take further questions or you know, to the extent that, that um, our hosts wish to invite others into the discussion, uh, this is a good breaking point. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. Yes, please, go ahead. So in 2018, there was the Bali FinTech Agenda, collaboration between the IMF and a number of other agencies. It pretty much put out 12 points that guide policymakers in establishing um, how you look at fintech. Was there any consideration on the Bali agenda? Because at the, the FCC, sorry, so Sugar Mongol here from the TTFCC, we would have used that to start to guide us in terms of setting our internal policy. I, I looked at the, the fintech toolkit and it's fairly practical with case studies. And Bali didn't really have that type of analysis because data wasn't available as yet. But it did put out very relevant points. Is, was there any consideration or connection between what Bali put out and what has been put out now through the, the FinTech toolkit? And would you say that the, the approach that Bali put out could also be used in conjunction what with what is being put out here. Um, so, so I, I don't want to uh, pretend to have intimate familiarity with with the the Bali uh, proposals. Um, 
Uh, I will say that um, the FinTech Toolkit is, as you point out, intended to be a very kind of practical on-ramp for engaging in uh, FinTech policy. Um, and that kind of set it apart from a number of other efforts to provide toolkits and, and reference materials. Uh, although I wouldn't say it was exclusive. There are others like the Alliance for Financial Inclusion uh, who also put out what I consider to be you know, kind of robust and helpful documents. But um, you know, this was intended to be complementary uh, to uh, existing resources and augmentatory. Um, I will also point out that we published it in, in 2019. So, uh, um, uh, so, so we, we were, we, we have been out for a couple of years now and, and uh, um, you know, I think that it is uh, uh, still relevant today because we took a far enough progressive stance in looking forward. But, you know, you tell us. I'd be very interested to hear if you, um, you know, kind of dug into the, the Commonwealth FinTech Toolkit and found either where it worked well for you or where it didn't. We, we would love the feedback. Other questions? Hi, good day. There was a question here that um, was asked before you joined about we can't copy and paste different methodologies from different places. Now, I believe that there's probably a, a big core of the infrastructure that can be copied based and you have to make it a little relevant, but I wanted to get your expert advice on what you think about that and what, what would be your answer. Um, I, I would agree with both contentions. You cannot copy and paste and um, particularly, there, there are sort of two dimensions to consider. One is, um, it's one thing to make financial regulation that works just inside your country and only inside your country. And it's another thing as soon as you have any contact with the outside world. So if, and I'll use the extreme example. If you're North Korea, you can make any financial policy you want because you barely do business with anyone except for China. But if you're almost any other nation on the planet, you have to interface with the global financial system where there are uh, both guidelines uh, and norms that require, are required for uh, money remittances that are necessary if you want to attract foreign direct investment to your country. Um, there, there are just things that you need to do if you're going to be part of a global financial system versus a single country financial system. So. Um, you know, you may look at regional norms, you know, so uh, um, it may be that, uh, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is less relevant for your economy and Barbados and Bermuda and Bahamas are more relevant for your economy. But, you know, you, you want to um, uh, uh, you want to consider the fact that there are other countries across the world that have adopted certain norms and also that um, you know, the, what, what we liked about the Commonwealth was there is some shared heritage uh, and some shared values which are reflected in the policies that then get implemented. Like, for example, the belief that it is good that people have access to the financial system. You know, there are some countries that, that sort of have more of a hierarchical view of the world where only some people should be allowed to have access to the financial system. But the countries drawing from Commonwealth heritage have tended to believe that there should be greater democracy and equality in society, that rights for women are important, uh, that uh, you know financial access is a good thing, right? Um, so, so I use those as, as very crude examples, but um, you know we found that you you absolutely cannot just copy and paste, but you can take inspiration from what other people have done and some of the challenges they ran into, in addition to the successes that they faced and then learn from those in, in crafting your own policies. Um, so I'll give a counter example. Um, in the US, and, and obviously this was not part of the toolkit, but it's one of my favorite examples of misguided government policy. Um, in the US, the state of New York uh, was trying to regulate cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and blockchain. And so they created something called the Bit License. And they said, if you're a company that wants to engage in Bitcoin and crypto, you need to get licensed by the state of New York. But the problem was that it cost more than $250,000 to get this bit license. 
which basically mean, meant that no startup companies could possibly get a bit license because it was too expensive. And so overnight, New York basically took itself off the map for being a fintech capital for at least five years, which created room for Singapore and Hong Kong and London and other places to, to kind of get uh, uh, the benefits of being more progressive about government policy, more enlightened. Um, so, so, you know, you can learn from those mistakes and not, not over-regulate, but also not under-regulate and have people lose their life savings speculating on Luna. <laughs> you know? Hi, I just have one question. I'll ask on behalf of um, Navin, um, who just raised a question. From your research in developing the FinTech toolkit, what sort of, how would have export import banks played a role? Because I know I look at the statistic, 95% in terms of the SMEs, because we understand the SME market is very important. But I don't know if you had any sort of case studies where uh, Exim banks would have played a role or leveraged FinTech in terms of addressing that sort of issue. Well, I, I mean, I'll try and take this a, a, a few different ways. Um, there have been some efforts or initiatives among various Exim banks to support fintech, to support trade. Um, and so, for example, in, in Africa, as you may be familiar with, uh, there's a pan-African uh, uh, continental free trade agreement uh, across 54 African countries. And the African Exim Bank is, uh, in support of that, putting more resourcing around supporting fintech to help. Right. Um, so that would be an example worth looking at. Um, uh, in general, you know, this, this issue of, of cross-border trade and of, of moving money across borders remains one that is quite problematic uh, in terms of costs and inefficiencies. So globally, there's about $10 trillion that is locked up in money that's just trying to move across borders because of float, because it takes as much as three days to settle cross-border money transfer. And, and three days times the amount of money traveling globally is trillions and trillions of dollars, uh, dollars US. And so we actually can use uh, new technology to reduce that to same day settlement and clearing of funds. Um, and so, so there are absolutely ways that import export banks can, can play in this world. Um, and it particularly look, it is on the axis of things like uh, um, improving efficiency and throughput. There's probably also some roles to play around compliance, but that, that you know, I think would go beyond the scope of today's discussion. You know, in general, the identity problem that I talked about before of ultimate beneficial owner and identifying individuals and customer due diligence is a shared problem. And a government is well constituted to support a shared utility for all of the financial institutions in their country as well as their trade counterparties to, um, reduce cost of compliance. That would be my very short summary of what's an entire other talk. <laughs> I see another question, I think. Sure, I have, uh, my name is Helen from the UNCDF. Um, I have a, a few quick comments and, and a question again, taking it back to the cryptocurrency conversation as well. Um, yes. We wanted to also note in terms of the import-export banks, there's most, I would assume, and I'm not sure if you've seen this in your work, but a lot of opportunities also for alternative lending for the medium enterprises as well, uh, using fintech to then substantiate or provide the rails to then help um, make more robust the credit scoring and the credit identity of certain firms in order to execute different loans. Um, the other point I wanted to make, uh, or sorry, the question I wanted to raise was back on yes. cryptocurrency because I do think that right now is an interesting conversation around central bank digital currency, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, how the blockchain uh, technology behind it, how to separate, and I certainly appreciate your point that there was just, you know, this is a large landscape. Some is hype, or, you know, don't quote me please, but, uh, you know, there's some potential of some technologies being hype, some, not all, everything is a panacea, um, but there's also a lot of promise and in other innovations. In terms of cryptocurrency, 
and central bank digital currency, I wanted to understand your perspective, uh, specifically because from my understanding of central bank digital currency, it requires a very robust digital ID and fast payment infrastructure underlying the central bank digital currency, not always with the blockchain, because for instance in China, I don't even think it's crypto anymore because it's not even on a blockchain. Yeah, to be discussed. Um, Digital RMB is a special case, but right. go on, I'm listening. Sure, so do you think there are applications of central bank digital currency that have really come in at this application and solved some of these problems, um, both within a financial inclusion perspective of expanding access to finance, because most of the cases we've seen required um, adults to already have a bank account before linking to the central bank digital currency. And the second point is, what is the role of digital ID fast payment systems and also other underlying infrastructures um, in terms of central bank digital currency being a leapfrog versus on the rails of these strong you know, digital finance infrastructures? Thank you. All right. Wow, thank you. That's a, that's a compound question. I'll try and answer it in two minutes because uh, I, I will have to, to ring off at, at, at 55. Uh, but thank you for the question. Please also pass my regards on to uh, Mr. Michon in, in New York. Um, so so um, uh, let's see. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll kind of take them in reverse order. The, the good news is that these ideas have been kind of passed around and worked on enough now that there's a lot of infrastructure you can rent. You don't have to invent this from scratch. There are a lot of people who've already built the technologies to be able to do fast payments and strong digital identity, and you can rent those in setting up a central bank digital currency today, whereas three years ago, five years ago, you would have had to invest a lot in building them yourselves because you couldn't rent a utility. Um, so there are infrastructure companies to rent from, and, and put a solution together around that. Um, uh, and open source code projects that, again, help reduce the cost and improve the security of these kinds of solutions. Um, you are absolutely correct to point out that there is a leapfrog opportunity, that because all of this investment has gone into this, I mean, there's been $600 billion of venture capital investment in fintech in the last seven years. And you sitting here today, if you go in to try and buy a country level solution, are, are able to benefit from all of that investment. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of stuff out there that you can rent or buy um, uh, that already has the benefit of having been field tested at least, if not market tested. Um, and yes, there is a leapfrog opportunity. There is a chance to sort of address several things at once um, with digital identity, with fast payments, and even with you know kind of a, a basic current account product you know, for people who don't have even a bank account or a bank account's too expensive, you can kind of have the, the lowest cost solution be available on the government central bank digital currency system and then anything fancier, you know, uh, the private sector can provide. And or, so there are different approaches. This is why you want to, you cannot just do one size fits all. There are also approaches, and China is an example of this, where um, the central bank digital currency essentially provides for, um, lower infrastructure costs, but the private sector continues to be the point of direct access for consumers and businesses. So you don't eliminate the private sector's role, but you empower them. Um, and each approach has trade-offs, pros and cons. Um, but uh, it's worth considering the impact of a central bank digital currency on your private sector when you implement it. Um, but you can help them out a lot, right? If, if you're new generation leapfrog financial system includes a shared identity utility, you can lower that cost that I talked about earlier of $10 to $130. You could take that cost down to a dollar for onboarding a new customer, which would help everybody, consumers, businesses, financial system, government. Everybody would be happier with that. Um, so uh, um, uh, I completely agree with, with the premise that um, you can leapfrog some old generation systems with, with these kinds of technologies. Okay, um, I would love to stay, but unfortunately I have to, <laughs> I have to jet off. Uh, but I am available uh, if you have questions. You've got my contact details here uh, uh, on the screen. Um, 
And, and I am very grateful for you taking the time uh, to, uh, to listen to me. And I hope if you go to the Commonwealth Secretariat website, uh, they have the FinTech Toolkit available for download, along with videos and other explainer articles and podcasts that kind of help amplify the story and, and how it plays out. Thank you so much for your time.